Okay, let's try this again. Everybody still here? Headbanging is good. Can you hear me now? I hope. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> Josh is nodding yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. So here we are. Take two. Uh, welcome back to the dining room and Scribble with Camille. Hooray! Hello! All right, we got, uh, who is Shadowhawk22? Who is that? I know who everybody else is. Yes, humans. Humans are here. Yays! Oh, hi! Hi! Hurrah! Excellent. All the way from Vermont. Wonderful. Welcome, Ms. Veta. It's good to have you here. And Gwyn. Excellent. Um, so, this is kind of uh, a back to basics class, uh, a stuff class, a what should I have in the scribal box class. Um, hello, Catherine. Excellent. Um, so yeah, we're going to go through um, some basic supplies. Yes, piranha plants, absolutely necessary. Um, not necessarily for a beginner, though. That might be a, that might be a, a later thing. Um, <laughs> but we'll go through um, the, the necessary tools, the helpful tools, and then the really, really helpful tools. Um, I have a handout for this. I just haven't uploaded it yet because there's a good chance we'll talk about um, some other items uh, that uh, aren't on my list yet. Uh, so we'll add them to the list and then I will upload the um, uh, the final definitive for the moment list. So you can take notes if you like, um, but we'll have notes uh, that you can kind of review later. Um, so yeah, um, there's uh, this is this is a list that um, Mr. Caroline, my Laurel, put together, um, and I've kind of updated it because a lot of the items, or just some of the items that were on it when she did it several years ago, um, companies have gone out of business or they're not um, making the same things they used to make, uh, but we'll, you know, the, the basics are still there. So we'll just start with the... Um, the necessary things. If you've never done Scribble before, here are things you're going to need to have to do anything. Um, there's a lot of overlap between calligraphy and illumination. Um, so we'll go with the, the combined list first and then break out calligraphy. I am not a calligrapher. I have the basic tools. Um, so a lot of the maybe more fun things that other calligraphers will have um, won't be on the list and won't be in my box, but we can chat about them and I will add them. Um, so the basics, if you're starting Scribble, um, you definitely need a ruler, a pencil of some kind, erasers, a pencil sharpener, paper, and decent lighting. Uh, Without any of those things, Scribble will not happen. So rulers, we'll start going through the rulers. Um, several different types. There's also wood. I don't have the wood ones with me at the moment. Um, oh, where are all the notes? All the notes. We're just going to go through it. So they come in various materials. Um, there's wood. There's wood with metal edging. There's plastic. Um, metal with the cork back, metal without the cork back. I like for myself um, the, uh, the, the metal with the cork back. Uh, they're non-slip. Um, this is a little bitty one that is new to me and I love it here. A uh, little six inch one uh, with the 18 inch. What's nice about these is you can use them with, oh do I have giant arms? <laughs> um, uh, what's nice about these is you can use them with pencil or ink or paint or ruling pens and because the cork lifts it off the paper a little bit um, they won't uh, 
you won't have the problem with ink or paint wicking underneath the um, ruler itself and blobbing all over your work. So those we love. Um, plastic is great because it is cheap, uh, light, uh, fairly flexible if you want it to be flexible and you can see through it. Um, not something you want to use with an exacto knife or anything sharp because it'll chomp right into the ruler and you won't have a straight straight edge anymore it'll have divots in it um, so that's rulers um, you want to also with your rulers calibrate them um, some inexpensive ones and I think this is this is the least expensive ruler I have I don't even know where it came from but occasionally you'll put one ruler up against another ruler and the inch mark won't quite match up with the inch marks the way they're supposed to. This one seems to be pretty good, uh, though it is, there is a little bit of drift in it. So depending on your tolerance for precision, uh, different rulers will give you different um, results. So uh, that's where we are on that. Um, going through pencils. There's all kinds of different pencils. The one that everybody probably has in, in their, their arsenal already is the good old yellow number two. Um, so it says number two, this one came from Staples, uh, and also HB. So the H and the B um, denotes the hardness or softness of the lead. HB is square in the middle of hard and soft. That's what all number two pencils are. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly firm lead, but it will still smear if you, um, if you rub your hand over it. Uh, it will go, the B uh, denotes a softer lead, where the H would denote a harder lead. So they'll go either, the, the, you get a, a, a zero through six, basically. You can have an HB right in the middle, and then you go from H to 2H all the way up to six or even eight H. And the higher the number, the harder the lead. The sharper the point you can make with a harder lead. And the longer your point will stay pointy, but the harder a lead you have, the more chance you have in actually denting the paper. Um, so you can get a nice sharp line, but you have to be careful not to press too hard or you'll get grooves in the paper. I like to use on uh, Bristol or Perg, typically. Uh, I don't go much above a 2H, uh, cause that for me is firm enough to make the lines and keep them fine enough, um, but not either dent the paper or, or smear if I accidentally brush it. Um, going down the softness scale, or up, up the softness scale, down the hardness scale, I guess, um, the Bs, the higher the number, the softer the lead. If you get a 6B pencil, you unless you're doing graphite, uh, scroll work, you generally don't want to go too far down into the bees um, because you'll have either soft lines that won't give you well-defined shapes to paint um, or, or you'll have a smeary graphite mess all over your Bristol board. Um, so HB is good, H, 1H or 2H. Um, if you're going very fine on, on perg or vellum, you know, the, the higher number H's um, can be useful also, but I like, I like me a 2H. Um, so there's your basic number two pencil. Uh, for that, you would need a sharpener, um, little collapsible one like so is great. Um, you know, you don't want to skimp on the sharpeners because some of them will just shred your lead and then there you are with a mess of graphite again. Uh, moving slightly up the food chain, 
we have my very fancy mechanical pencil. Uh, most mechanical pencils that you can buy just in the packet um, from Staples or wherever will have HB lead in them. The fancier mechanical pencils, you can get um, leads for them and uh, they come in different widths as well. Um, I'm not sure what the paper mate is, but the fancy purple pencil here has a 0.7 millimeter lead. Uh, that's really big for what we do. If you can find 0.5 or 0.3, you'll get nicer lines on your um, on your Bristol. I think eh, it's hard to tell. These might be the same. Might be the same. Um, and again, you can have you can have uh, different lead hardnesses depending on the type of pencil you get. Um, nice thing about these is they don't need sharpening. You click or you twist and then you have more graphite. Um, to get real fancy, we have the drafting uh, pencils, the lead pointers. Um, these are a different kind of mechanical pencil. Um, they, they are lead holders. This one's a 4H. I don't know if we can see that. It's kind of hard to see on there. Anyway, it says 4H, um, printed right on the graphite itself. Leads will come in the little tubes like so. Oop, and there's a broken one. Sometimes they're pre-sharpened like that. This is my last H lead. The nice thing is they last a long time. Um, comes like six, six to a tube, I think. To use these type of pencil, you need a lead pointer or a special sharpener, like so. Um, can also pull off the end, and I'm getting covered in pencil dust. Uh, some of them, many of them, will have a sharpener right on the uh, right on the end of the pencil itself but this takes forever um, but you can you know put your put your lead in there and twist and twist and twist and twist so if you don't have one of these sharpeners and you have a lot of time you can do it that way um, but to put a point on this you take your sharpener take your pencil put in and give it a few turns And then we have a lot of graphite dust and a nice sharp point on our 4H. And then we put it back in there and drop the pencil. Um, I tend to keep my sharpener in a plastic baggie so I don't get graphite dust all over my pencil box. So that's the fancy one and they're wonderful but um you know just your basic mechanical pencil does just fine to start um erasers three basic kinds of erasers i like to use this one happens to come in a lovely set uh kneaded eraser a gum eraser and uh the white soft rubber eraser. This is the, that's the key there. Um, where are my notes on erasers? The smooth white artist erasers um, are your basic, you'll use it everywhere. Um, it's soft rubber, so it doesn't mark up your paper. Uh, don't use the pink pearl erasers. They are fairly abrasive. Um, they'll damage the paper and your calligrapher will hate you as they go to uh, put ink on it and it turns into a giant blob. You can erase the lead you got all over your fingers with them too. Um, gum erasers I've found are really good for use on pergaminata uh, because it doesn't smear so much. Um, I've used the soft white erasers and I got a giant smear of pencil all over and then the gum eraser just sort of crumbles into nothing. Um, 
as you use it. The kneaded erasers are fun because uh, they have a dual purpose. Um, so this one's very old, but they still work. You just sort of mush it around a little bit. And these are great because you can form them into whatever shape you want and make a little point if you happen to have a uh, spot on your scroll where you have to get into a tight spot, uh, kneaded erasers are great for that. Um, you can also use it as silly putty to hold on uh, in your in your offhand when you're painting to keep stress down. <laughs> I use it as a, a stress tool. Um, yeah, pink erasers will mark mark the page and then you have pink marks because of the pink eraser and terrible rough spots on your on your paper. Um, so yeah, kneaded eraser, toy and useful tool. Um, and the more you play with it, the softer it gets and the more shapes you can do. But those are the basic, those are your, your basic erasers. There's also, if you do a lot of work on uh, black paper, the soft white eraser works for that. Um, but they also do make a, a special black eraser for the black paper um, in case you find you're getting fuzzies trying to render the Energizer bunny. Well, then then the pink eraser might be okay, but you want to make sure it's not too fuzzy. Because then, then I don't know, harder to paint. Um, so no pink erasers. Put them away. Throw them away. Get rid of them. Um, so, uh, which means, going back to the pencil, don't use the erasers on the backs of the pencils because those are the pink erasers. This one has one of the soft rubber white erasers on it. So um, usable, but check your erasers anyway before you touch them to your final page, because sometimes they'll get old and dry out. And that's no good for anybody. Okay, I went through that. Uh, paper. Paper is important. Um, you want, Starting out, use white paper. Um, it's tempting to get into the ivory colors and uh, funny calligraphy paper to make things look aged and fancy, but in period manuscripts, they were done on the whitest, purest vellum that they could find because the, the, the importance of these books and the only reason they are uh, ivory colored now is because they're old. They're 400, 600 years old. So age will do that. Um, yes, clicky white eraser and, and cut on angle. I have, I have cut bits off of this eraser uh, on, on, on multiple occasions so I can get them into little tight things. Yes, the ivory papers are pretty and that's why we have the natural colored pergamonata. Uh, I like using the natural colored pergamonata, the white. It's very, it's a very strange personal preference, you know, once you get into, once you get into this. But uh, going back to Bristol, so we have Bristol board. Um, there's smooth texture and vellum texture. Calligraphers tend to like the smooth because the ink uh, and the nibs will flow over it a little easier. It's not, it's a smooth, it doesn't have any, any texture on the paper. Um, I prefer a vellum finish. Uh, it just it gives it a slightly different look. Um, the paint tends to stay where you you put it. Um, it, it will stay either place. Um, but it's a, a nice thick board. Um, Strathmore is just one brand. Uh, some people prefer arches. Uh, some people don't. Arches is very expensive. Bristol uh, done with uh, the Strathmore Bristol is, is fairly affordable um, and will last a while. Again, Pergamonata is a smoother uh, texture. Um, I don't know why you didn't find it when you were paper shopping. Um, it's in the art section. Always a bummer. It's only 20 sheets. Yes, but 20 sheets will last you 
quite a while, depending on how many scrolls you do um, on that. Um, so yeah, Pergamonata, a little bit different. Um, whatever you get for paper, you want to make sure it's archival or acid free. Um, you don't want to go for architectural vellum. Uh, it's a very thin, almost like a tracing paper and not what we want to use for a scroll. It won't hold up to um, the, the liquids we're putting on it um, and it will wrinkle and buckle and will make you sad. So uh, Bristol is recommended for that. Um, and yes, Pergamonata, thank you. Thank you, Lisbetta. Um, paper, taking care of that. Um, so decent lighting is the last absolutely necessary thing we'll need. Um, and that comes in the form of a room uh, with a lot of sunshine. Um, or daylight light bulbs. Um, you know, you, you want you want nice bright light. Um, otherwise you're not going to get accurate colors. You'll have some eye strain. The older you get, the more frustrated you will get with your eyeballs, I'm noticing. <laughs> Glasses are a thing. Um, you know, the most economical bit of lighting is like a swing arm lamp swing arm lamp with a daylight light bulb. Um, Ot lights, though, are becoming more and more affordable. Uh, you can get those at Joanne Fabrics or craft stores, and they generally have uh, true color light bulbs or, or daylight light bulbs. Um, I don't know, we can't really see. Uh, we're going to adjust things. So this is my very old, um, we're working on it here, uh, floor mounted but now it's on the table because we get better uh, angle on the light um hot light with a fluorescent bulb um it's not on because we don't need it for this evening but it is uh, a lifesaver on multiple occasions um and yes magnifying light up glasses uh i i'm still getting used to glasses myself so adding magnification and light right near my eyeballs. I don't know how uh, how we'd go with that, but I'm glad you are enjoying them. Um, so yeah, light, light. Sunlight is best, um, but daylight light bulbs are a close second. Uh, so that's the, that's the kind of crossover, everything you need to start on the illumination side, we'll start with that. Uh, the necessary items are basic brushes, gouache paint in basic colors, the paint palette, and rinse water cups and paper towels. The basic brushes, you want to make sure you have, excuse me, something with a nice point to it that will hold the point. Um, I tend to be hard on my brushes, so I don't go for the $7 a piece, $20 a piece, Sable, beautiful uh, Windsor Newton line. These are some really nice ones. Artist Loft, I, I was surprised. Um, this is the Michaels brand, um, but I tend to go for the round or the liners. You, uh, you know, we have a number two round here. Can we see this? Yes, okay. Uh, number two round for larger spaces, a number one for some more detail work, and then a, a 10 0 liner um, for outlines. And um, let me get these adjusted right over there. Um, 10 0 liner for outlines, white work, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, this is the, the professional grade of the cheap stuff. Um, you know, as you, as you get into more painting, um, you, can, you can go with 
you know, more sizes. I have a ridiculous amount of brushes. Uh, this is just a small sampling of them. Um, it's a lot of different twos and threes and ones and lining and it's good to have a dedicated one for white work, uh, a dedicated one for black outline. Um, and at the very least, you don't want to use the one you've used for black for your white because it's all going to be grayed out, uh, no matter how well you clean it. Um, another <clears throat> useful brush to have would be um, a small flat one uh, for mixing colors or for reconstituting paint. You don't want to use a, a, uh, uh, a nice pointed brush and ruin your point mixing. And oh my goodness, a 10-0 short liner for everything. And you know, if that works for you and you don't go crazy, good on you. Um, it's, you know, you, you find, you find what tools work for you. Yeah, this, this materials list is the opinion of uh, two or three scribes once we get into the calligraphy stuff. My, my uh, apprentice brother, now Laurel sibling, uh, Alexander, gave me some advice on the calligraphy end of things. Um, so this is just a starting point and you use what works for you, don't use what doesn't. And if you find something else, share with the class because more uh, scribal tools and, and more art supplies brings joy. That's why we do it. We have all the, the collecting of the brushes and the paints. Um, so, right, the goblin comes out. Anyway. Um, Gouache paint in basic colors. Gouache is something you do not want to cheap out on. Um, Holbein is a good brand. Winsor Newton is a good brand. M. Graham is uh, a good brand, getting more expensive. Um, there's one that starts with a T that I can't remember because I've never used it. But uh, basically, if it costs $5 for a 20 pack, it's probably not very good gouache. Um, you know, stay away from Reeves, stay away from Artist Loft, stay away from, um, uh, there was another one I can't think of, a, you know, but again, if you're, if you're paying less than a dollar a tube, it's probably not good. And, and when I say not good, it's usable. Some people get really good results from Reeves. Um, I cannot. Um, the difference is the quantity of pigment to binder. You know, Reeves and the other inexpensive uh, brands are going to have pigment that's not ground as fine, so you get lumps or streaks in your paint. Um, it may not be as light fast or as color true. So all kinds of all kinds of frustrations that can come from uh, from inexpensive cheap gouache, and you don't want to start with something that's going to frustrate you because then you won't want to do it. Um, so it's it's a fairly you know the the, the expensive bit is the gouache, uh, but that's something you want to you want to budget for. Um, as far as how much it costs, I haven't bought paint in a while, so. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, somewhere, you know, uh, one tube. So this is this is the the ivory black uh, Holbein, you um, know, and they last they last a long time. Um, Twelve and a half years ago, when I started doing scribal, I got a pack of twelve little five millimeter tubes, and I still have most of them. Um, CNN, permanent yellow, and ultramarine deep, and some of them you don't use as much. You know, the carmine is pretty much used and gone. Um, but I think this, the 12 pack of your basic gouache colors, oh, and that looks like, that looks like all of them. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got eight left out of the 12. Um, the colors that aren't here anymore is, uh, we've got the ultramarine light, white, ivory black and I'm not sure what the 
what the fourth one was. But I think the 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 twelve pack um, costs something like twenty eight to thirty six dollars. Uh, so you're looking at you know three dollars a three dollars a tube for the little guys. Um, but yeah, gouache is from Holbein and Windsor and Newton range from seven to fourteen dollars. If you go to a place like Jerry's Artorama uh, or Dick Blick, oftentimes they are uh, discounted. So you know certain colors. Um, yes, whole bean. You have to grind it yourself. No, <laughs> um, whole bean, uh, like the guy, like the artist. Um, but Jerry's Artorama or Dick Blick will um, often be discounted. So you're looking at four fifty to eight or twelve dollars uh, per tube. And the fancier colors are going to be a little bit more. Your basic colors are are in the lower end. But again, they last a long time, um, you know, depending on what style of illumination you're doing, you're going to run through colors quicker, uh, some colors quicker than others. White, um, this is my, my permanent white, that's not much left. But if you find you're using a lot of permanent white, it also comes in uh, 40 milliliter uh, tubes. So there's a there's there's plenty there yeah 40 milliliter i don't know how much this one uh cost at all um, but if you're in maine or new england and they may even ship uh other places in the country artists and craft craftsmen supply uh is a great local business i think they're all over the country actually so that you should be able to to look up artists and craftsmen supply um locally we have a few skadians working at the portland shop so support them uh, but your basic gouache colors if you don't go for the 12 um, 5 milliliter starter set um, ivory black and permanent white uh, those are those are you know black and white and you get your grays and then you want a blue uh, most illuminations ultramarine light is a good match color match for the blues um, you want a pure red and in the whole bean line uh, that's geranium it's a slightly translucent red um, but it's pretty close to it, it doesn't have a whole lot of blue or a whole lot of yellow to to skew it one way or the other um, one that's more uh, opaque is carmine but the carmine has a little bit of blue in it, so it's a more, it's a cooler red. Geranium is right down the middle. Um, it's, it's a pure red. There is a color called pure red, but it's almost too bright. It's, it's too, too pure. <laughs> um, then you'll want a yellow, uh, either Naples yellow or yellow ochre. Um, yellow ochre is basically Naples yellow without any white mixed in. Um, Naples yellow is a little bit lighter, a little bit brighter. Um, so if you have yellow ochre and permanent white, you can make your Naples yellow. Um, and then imitation gold, uh, you, need a, you need a gold um, gouache also. Uh, so right here, you have the makings of a bar and ivy scroll 1400s um, hunting book of Gaston Phoebus you know the red and blue bars with the red and blue and gold leaves so it's a good starting palette um, once you get into more art we can start building on other colors and this is going into the the next section the helpful section but since we're talking about paint the next two colors you'd want to obtain uh, would be a green and olive green is a nice medium uh, green color you know mixes well with others uh, not too bright not too dark not too yellow not too blue um, so a good good green and then burnt umber uh, is a lovely brown and that is what you'll want to use if you have to darken a lot of colors. Um, 
mixing black will not give you, and I discovered this very early on, if you if you mix black with a color, it won't darken it, it will turn it different. <laughs> mixing, mixing ivory black and yellow ochre kind of turns the yellow ochre green, uh, because the ivory black, I believe, I don't actually know the pigment uh, that's in here, but it's slightly bluish uh, when you mix it with yellow, so that's fun. Um, if you're in the East Kingdom or Kalantir, um, iris purple is a lovely pure purple uh, for more, uh, more colors to buy, because purple is a pain in the butt to mix, um, in, unless you have the pure red and the pure blue. Um, ultramarine and geranium will get you kind of a mud puddle. Yeah. Yes, black pigment is tough. What I want to play with is black 3.0, the one that's so black, it sucks in all the light and it makes everything matte. It's like Vanta black without the depth. Yeah, very exciting. <laughs> so yeah, iris purple is a beautiful purple. Um, and then now that the East has our silver level awards, um, a metallic silver, would be uh, something to add to your paint box also. So you'll notice too that um, these are all whole bean except for my two metallics. I have used the whole bean metallics and they kind of look like glitter to me. Um, the, what did I say? Windsor, Windsor Newton. Is that what I said? I don't remember what I said. Anyway, um, I've used the whole bean metallics and the mica that they use to get the sparkle in them, I think is not ground as finely um, as in the Windsor Newton. Um, so particularly with the silver in the whole bean, I painted it on and it looked like a disco ball. And I decided I didn't want a disco ball on the scroll. So we have gone with the Windsor Newton. So there's a, uh, there's your basic gouache set. Um, you can pretty much make other colors. There's not a whole lot of orange used that I've seen in illuminations, um, but the yellow ochre and the geranium, you can you can play with that and mix it up, and uh, you've got you've got a good range. And then you know as you as you do more painting you will find, hey, I really need this weird color of pink because I'm doing Visconti hours. And then there's where uh, magenta and rose come in. So one place to look for paint too is eBay. Because uh, sometimes you get lucky and there's a, an art store that's been closed out and somebody's bought it and you get 187 tubes of gouache for $350 and you split the winnings between yourself and eight of your very best new friends um, and you end up paying about a dollar or two dollars a tube for the good stuff. So that is, uh, that's how to get a big amount of paint for not very much money if you're lucky, <laughs> if you're very lucky. Um, so yeah, enough about paint for now. Put these all back in. Uh, rinse water and, uh, rinse water cups, you know, gone with the, uh, little wee yogurt cup, which has water in it. So I'm not going to show you the, the label because it'll spill all over the place. This is it, you know, something glass or plastic that isn't going to uh, dissolve like a paper Dixie cup uh, would. Uh, what do I use to carry, store all the scribal? I will show you my various boxes, Gwen, shortly. Um, but yeah, nice little yogurt cups works. Um, if you have Tiberius uh, makes lovely scribal cups, there's his, I don't know if we can see the, the symbol on the bottom there. Um, Tiberius is wonderful. He is a Roman from uh, Lisbetta's neck of the woods and he's made these beautiful cups on the advice of Mistress Christiana Crane 
Um, she said they need to be a nice heavy bottom so it doesn't tip over. Uh, the lip, you know, the rim is rolled in ever so slightly. Uh, so when you swish your paintbrush around, the drops mostly stay in. Um, and then it's got spots on this one for two brush rests and it's pretty perfect and I love it. Uh, but you don't need it, but it's nice to have. A little yogurt cup. Uh, paper towels too. Bounty. Keep a roll. Um, you'll need it for lots of things. Um, and then the last bit with the paint is a paint palette. Um, more wells are better. The little six ones are nice if you need a, a range of of one color. Yes, you don't need it, but you want it. I think you need it. I needed it, so I bought it. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, but back to the palettes. Uh, these are, I've found them, you know, 50 cents a piece at craft stores, Amazon, eBay, they have it. Um, mine are plastic. You can get them in ceramic. Uh, there's different different shapes and, and sizes. Um, this one is one that has a cover, which is great because there's just more room for mixing all kinds of different crazy paint colors. Um, and you can you can close it up. So it's got a thumb thing too, so you can pretend you're Bob Ross. I don't know. Um, typically I don't I don't hold mine because I get my thumb in the paint. Uh, but options. Um, but it's, you know, the more little wells you have, it's not, it's handy to have one with little wells and then, and then larger areas, uh, for mixing just small amounts of paint. Cause sometimes you just need it for, for one little flower petal, um, and all that. So yeah, there's also, there's also, uh, palette sheets, palette paper. Um, if you're not going to be reusing your paint and, and you hate cleaning up. That's magnificent too. Um, yeah, it's a it's a like a really thick, slightly coated paper, uh, Gwen, that I've seen. Um, so yeah, and a palette with the middle separated into thirds. There's there's a zillion out there. Um, I tend to go for the round ones with what is it, ten wells, ten wells. That seems to be good for me. But use what works for you. It's a glorious thing. Um, so yeah, that's the basics on illumination. For calligraphy, the uh, unique things would be India or calligraphy ink and calligraphy pens. So there are, so here's one of my scribal boxes as requested from Gwen. Um, this was given to me. I don't know how old it is, but it's quite lovely. And this is what I use to hold uh, generally the calligraphy and the gold leaf supplies. Um, but since we're talking about calligraphy here, yeah, a fancy fancy and it's got a secret compartment there. This is all the gold leaf stuff. Um, and charcoal and a few other things that I don't even know what's in here. I'll have to go through that. Um, but we'll cover that up for now. No one knows. No one knows its secret. Um, so I don't have any cartridge pens to show you. Um, but that's one uh, type. It's a, a Rotring um, or there's other, other brands. Let me see here. Um, so backing up. Uh, there's basically three types of callig calligraphy pens. There's felt tip, which should really only be used for practice. You can get them at uh, in like a, a six pack um, for a few dollars. Out of order. Um, and it's a it's a chisel tipped felt uh, pen. Um, they do tend to fuzz after not much time, but it's good for just playing, getting your hand moving in the right, uh, uh, you know, getting the motions down. Um, 
don't want to waste your good Bristol using the felt tip pens. They work fine on, you know, typing paper or graph paper just for practice. Uh, dip pens are what I use. Um, it consists of a holder. Uh, this is a nice one for someone like me with a death grip on their pen. I still have a dent in my finger after I've done it, um, but it's got the little cork bit on there. Uh, this is a speedball one you can find um, in at Michael's. Uh, there's a couple more straight uh, pen holders here, uh, made of wood. This one's plastic. But all of your all of your dip pens are gonna have a, a nib holder. I don't know if we can zoom in how far we can zoom in so we can see that at all. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but there's a little round, little round thing with some teeth. Um, and then we have your nibs. Um, so the nib is the bit that makes the letters. Here for, now. for your dip pens, there are a zillion different nibs out there. I am not the one to ask about nibs. I use uh, Mitchell for the most part. Uh, William William Mitchell, or uh, I think William William Mitchell. No, that was mine. No, oh, I don't even know what they are. Yeah, William Mitchell. There we go which incidentally was also the name of one of my teachers in college. So there's a fun fact. Uh, but Mitchell round hand nibs. Doing, doing the calligraphy, you want round hand. You don't want drawing nibs or um, copper plate. We don't do copper plate. That's post period. Uh, but the round hand is what we use. And I think, let me see here. Uh, Three and a half. So the larger, larger the the tip, the lower the number. So this is a this is a three and a half. Um, I don't know. It's a millimeter, maybe slightly less than a millimeter. Anyway, um, they've got a, a little well for ink, uh, but you can also buy these little things, which is a uh, like a an add-on ink well. They just slide on to the back of your nib, like so, and properly adjusted. They hold more ink than just the nib itself, um, so you don't have to dip as often. Um, I think you can buy a set of these. They're like a dollar sixty a piece or so. Um, John Neal Booksellers would be the place to go for them. And sometimes it fits and sometimes it doesn't, but they just kind of, there we go, figure out how to make it fit in the holder comfortably so it won't fall out in the middle of your scroll. Um, and there you go. So dip and write. Um, but yeah, you can get a, you can get a, a six pack of the most common sizes that we'll use. I think it goes from a two up to a six, which is the itty bitty one. Uh, very, very small. I don't know how we can see that. Yeah, it's, trust me, it's small. Um, so that's your basic, your basic calligraphy nibs. Leonard is another one, and Browse uh, is another good brand. I think those are a little stiffer than the Mitchells. Uh, so if you have a firm hand, like I do, uh, those might be a good place to start, because they're a little bit um, they can take a little bit more abuse <laughs> than what uh, sometimes we'll dish out. Um, having a few drawing nibs isn't a bad thing either um, for flourishes and little details. Um, these are a couple different. Uh, Hunt is a brand. I want to say Hunt is what they sell with the speedball um, uh, kits in craft stores. And speedball is okay um but again for a beginner it's better than reeves gouache <laughs> personally um but upgrade when you can um crow quills are another 
little dip pen you can use for flourishes. And I have a second one here somewhere. There we go. No. There we are. Nope, that's a pencil. All right, well, the other one's gone walkabout, but a crow quill is called because uh, in period they were made, I believe, with crow feathers, um, much smaller, finer details. Um, there's various types of nibs you can get for those also. And there's two different kinds of holders also. Uh, this one, I'm trying to find, oh, there it is, here we go. So I don't know if we can see this, and the nib is stuck in this one, so I can't really show it to you. Uh, but there's this one on the left has just a round hole. Um, so that's where these two nibs would fit, because they have a tubular um, insert bit. I'm sure there's a name for it, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> and then there's there's this setting which is like the speedball uh pen holder it's a it's a circle or a, a co um <laughs> cylinder inside a inside a cutout so you can slide the the nib shaped nibs into it um but yeah crow quills very sharp very pointy excellent for fine 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 detailed work um, and very painful when you poke yourself on accident. So don't do that. Yeah. Um, they don't hold as much ink as, you know, your, your regular dip pen. And I found depending on what ink I'm trying to use, uh, some, some nibs will work and some will not. Um, you know, it depends, depends how it flows, depends how the, um, the consistency of the ink is thinner inks. You can use a, a, a broader range of, of nibs. Um, you just kind of have to play with it until you find what works. <laughs> so, and Alcoid's tins, the mini ones are good for keeping all your nibs in. Uh, also at Michael's, um, they used to have these. This is an old kit. Um, Leonard is a good brand. This is a drawing set, but it comes with a pen holder and a little pen case. Um, they used to have a calligraphy um, kit, but I haven't seen that in a while. So look for this, but it's, it's Leonard, which is a good brand, and you get a neat little case too. Um, inks. There are so many different inks out there, uh, mostly divided into two categories. There's waterproof, which is India ink, and water-based. Um, calligraphy ink has a wide range of colors, but you want to be careful what you buy because some of them are not light fast. Um, Dr. P. H. Martin of uh, the Magical White Paint, which is actually ink, that we use for white work, um, they do ink. And they've got a couple different lines of calligraphy ink. Uh, they've got some metallics. Um, one line is color fast and one is not. So pay attention to what you're buying. But for the most part, uh, Windsor Newton. And again, Michaels used to have a kit um, with a pen and a few nibs and four different colors of calligraphy ink. Um, it says for dip pen and brush, for fountain and dip pens, it as long as it's flowing well, you can use it. These are both um, water-based, so like gouache, it will re-wet if you get it wet. So use caution when drawing next to paint or painting next to ink or don't spit on the scroll, don't lick the scroll. Uh, but they they also, they clean well. Um, the blue cap and the red cap mean something, and I'm not sure what. Um, I think, I think the red cap is matte and the blue cap is a, a more semi-gloss. Um, but again, water-based. Uh, this is a crimson red 
and, and a matte black. Um, the gold, my gold I've discovered has dried out quite a bit, so I've got some water in there and we're shaking it, but I'm not holding out much hope. So make sure the caps are on tight or your ink dries out. Fun stuff. Um, India ink is not a water-based ink, uh, or it's waterproof rather. Um, so if you use India ink, make sure you wash your brush and your nibs as soon as possible, or you'll have stuck India ink in them. Um, Ian the Green, who is a Skadian down in Oklahoma, is a wonderful ink maker. I posted his video on uh, Brazil wood ink uh, earlier in the week. Uh, that's a, a period red ink, um, but he makes uh, iron gall and oak gall inks. Um, this is one of his bottles. He has a, an Etsy store, which I'll is linked in um, in the handout, so that'll get posted. Um, but shout out to Ian Groovy. Uh, this is an ink he developed a few years ago when Alexander was being laureled, uh, and it is a a period recipe that blackens on pergamonata. Um, interesting bit about your oak gall and iron gall inks. They take a long time to darken on PERG because of just the way the paper and the ink react to each other. Um, you use them on vellum and they're, they turn black very nicely. On Bristol board, they turn black very nicely. On PERG, it just sort of sits there and is gray forever and looks awful. Um, so through much trial and testing, uh, he came up with with this formulation and it works on everything and it's wonderful and it smells like vinegar because I think it's made with red wine. Um, so that's fun. Uh, the period period ink recipes uh, are great to have. Um, also, I don't know if it's waterproof or not. It's worth testing. Uh, so there's your there's your basic what you need for calligraphy and what you need for illumination. Um, moving on to category two, the things you don't need but are really nice to have, the helpful things. Um, we have the cork back ruler, which we talked about when I talked about rulers in the first section there. Uh, plastic T-square, small triangle, a drawing board half an inch thick, Low tack tape or drafting dots, a swing arm lamp, and white cotton gloves are kind of the, the crossover things. Um, so again, corkback ruler we talked about. Um, the plastic T-square, uh, 12 to 18 inches. I don't actually have one. I went straight to the big one. Um, but the T-square is good for, um, I can't even... It won't even fit in the camera. Uh, but the T-square, you know, you butt it up against the side of your, your table, your artist um, page. Yeah, we're getting to the Ames lettering guide, don't you worry. Um, and then that makes sure your paper's lined up with your edge, with your straight lines, and it, it helps keep everything at the angle it should be. So your T-square gets used in conjunction with Uh, triangles. We've got a couple in here. So this is, I can't find my small triangle, so maybe one thing that's missing from the helpful uh, section already is a place to put all your art stuff so it won't uh, wander off and get lost places. So yeah, organization's a thing. Anyway, uh, small triangle, put it up against the T-square, which is not laying flat, but you can draw angles, straight lines like so. I don't know how well we can see all of this. Um, but again, helps with your keeping everything straight. Um, there's a couple, again, different kinds of triangles out there. This is a uh, flat one that's used for uh, pencil drafting, so it sits right on the paper, the edge goes right to the paper. You don't want to use this one with ink or paint. 
um, this one has a little bit of a lip on it. Uh, so the edge, there's a gap and you can use paint, you can use ink and it won't wick underneath. Um, I prefer those. They work for pencil just as well as ink. Uh, drawing board, half an inch thick. It's a nice flat surface. And if you get, um, it's MDF, I think. Hang on, looking through my list here. Um, yes, uh, half inch thick MDF handy panel from Home Depot. Um, nice, smooth, heavy. You can tape um, your work to it and it's not going anywhere. Uh, just something that's not your table to paint on is really helpful. Um, for multiple reasons, not the least of which being you can move it around if you uh, if you need to. Um, yeah. Ooh, that's why. Um, which which is why on the triangles or the the gap between the the ruler. We had a question. I'm sure she's typing. We'll get back to your question or your statement. Um, low tack tape or drafting dots? Broad tape, good stuff. Um, keeps things from moving around and doesn't stick uh, too sticky. -y. Oh, triangles with the lip, yes, used for inks paints, keeps it from blobbing, just like the corkback rulers. Yeah, painter's tape. Um, you can buy the fancy little drafting dots. Um, if you have them, fantastic. If not, painter's tape. Um, you do want to be careful with it because it's not archival or acid free. So if you leave it on your work for a while, um, there's a chance that it could discolor where the tape was. Um, not immediately, it could be a year down the road, it could be five years down the road, but you may, um, you know, you may have marks where your tape was because it, it will leave the slightest amount of adhesive behind, which is where, you know, the drafting dots uh, come in handy because Generally, they are acid free. Um, so yeah, minimize your use of this, but put it on the edges uh, and uh, you know keeps it keeps it from moving around on you. Um, drive yourself great. Oh, yes, because they have that gap. So yeah, if you're doing a lot of pencil work, the triangles without the without the lip are probably better. Um, but you just have to get used to it. Yeah, I'll see mine mine have a, a lip on both sides. <laughs> so Josh is sitting next to me making flip it over gestures and I can't, it won't make a difference. Um, <laughs> swing arm lamp goes along with lighting. You know, multiple light sources keep shadows from uh, taking over your work. Uh, and more light helps you see better. Um, white cotton gloves uh, is something that I've taken to using in recent years. You know, there's your white cotton glove. That one's kind of complete. But what I do is I cut off the fingertips on the first three fingers. So you can still hold your paintbrush, but you don't have to worry as much about getting hand oils on your work. Um, you want to protect the painting surface from oils, even if you think your hands are perfectly dry, uh, they are not. Um, and you'll, if, especially if you're doing ink, uh, any sort of substance on the paper, particularly oil, will cause the ink to uh, splooge. 
for lack of a better word, feather. Um, it will it will not stay nice and crisp like you want it to. So protecting your hand, protecting the paper. Um, some people will put a sheet of paper between their hand and the work, and I found that when I did that, all I did was drag my paper through the newly painted paint. Uh, so not a good time for me. Yeah, and the cotton gloves, 10 pairs or something on Amazon. You can get them in CVS. Uh, look in like the hand lotion aisle. It's what people, you know, you put lotion on your hands at night and then put the gloves on to protect your hands. Um, I usually have to ask because I can't ever remember where they are. <laughs> but those are the, those are the helpful things. Uh, illumination, the uh, unique items to that. Uh, we have more brushes in different sizes, uh, more gouache colors, both of which we kind of talked about. Um, a pipette. Pipettes are lovely and inexpensive, and this will help you uh, be more um, accurate, more particular, more measured in mixing your paint with your water, your water with your paint, rather. Uh, one drop at a time is a whole lot easier with an eyedropper or a pipette uh, than it is trying to shake it off a brush or off your finger, which is what I did for years and then went, they're a dollar for 30 of them. Let's get them. Um, so little pipettes. Local folks, I have a whole bunch of them. So if you need pipettes, just ask. Don't go out and buy them yourself. I will pop them in the mail to you. Um, let's see, a compass and circle templates and a protractor. Uh, not everything we draw or paint is going to be nice and straight and square. So um, where'd my compass go? Hmm. Here somewhere. There it is. compass for when you have need of circles larger than what your circle templates will do. Uh, and again, there's a couple, there, there are a whole bunch of different styles of circle templates. There's ovals, there's squares, um, funny rectangles, I found the circles I use most often. Um, there's, again, two different bump styles. I think all of mine have the bumps on them. So again, ink versus pencil. Um, if you're going to be using ink or paint directly with the circle templates, get the ones with the little bumps on the back because that will uh, help lift them off the page. Can we see the bumps? I don't know if we can see the little bumps. Uh, but that lifts that lifts it off the page just enough so your ink won't wick, your paint won't wick underneath and blob. Um, you know, compass. This is one that uses the lead uh, from the from the lead pencil points. Um, nice precision one. Uh, I've seen a tool. Dick Blick had one that you could basically clamp it to a ruler in two places. So if you need a really big circle, um, that's helpful there. Uh, so, and then, oh, here's my, there it is. Here's my little bitty triangle from earlier. This is one that has a flat side and a raised side. I knew I had them somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, this one, this one is flat. You put it down here and then it, it's got a, an edge to it on that side. So a nice little, you know, six inch triangle. Nice one. And then, don't use it very often, but a protractor, of course, if you have to split a circle into uh, even slices, that are not four. All your circle templates generally will have the cardinal points marked, but if you need to do six pieces or um, 
you know, seven, you can use your math skills that you should remember from geometry class and uh, figure out how many degrees and mark it off on your protractor and then use your lovely rulers and T square to split that circle into the right number of pi pieces. Uh, so circle tools. But again, most often um, I'll use these two templates. The largest size on here is two and a quarter inches. Uh, this one goes all the way up to three and a half, I think is the biggest one. Yes. Yeah. Um, what's neat about this here, I think all the edges or the corners may have a different, slightly different radius to them. I haven't played with that, but that's kind of fun. Um, so yeah, your circle template's good for, um, you know, badges and, and order medallions and things. Uh, protractors are great for making illuminations with an arch on the top. Yes, yes, perfect, perfect curve right in there. Um, okay, uh, next, graph paper. I use, uh, for every scroll, almost every scroll I've ever done, I draw it out first on graph paper. Um, because it helps me keep all my lines straight and my spaces spaced and uh, keeps everything in order for me. Um, with the graph paper, of course, you have to transfer it somehow onto your, your final paper. Um, and that comes with, uh, you'll need a light table or something like that. 10 squares per inch, four squares per inch, eight squares per inch, whatever you're comfortable with um, for a while. But again, on the graph paper, like your rulers, you want to bet it and make sure. Um, <laughs> yes, Lizabetta, who draws directly on all of her vellum because she's wonderful <laughs> and an artiste, and I am jealous of your skills. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, for, for whatever whatever graph paper you get, oh, oh, where is it? I've got a couple different ones right here. Uh, let's see. So I think this one, this is a 10 squares per inch. And I don't generally take it down to tenths of an inch. Four squares per inch. Uh, and I think this is, oh, I can't tell. So some of the more inexpensive papers don't line up all the lines. So they're printed on both sides and sometimes your line on one side will not be in line with the line on the back. So when you're trying to trace something that gets confusing. Um, This is, Canson is a wonderful brand for papers in general. Um, this is eight squares per inch and it's high quality graph paper and the lines on the front line up with the lines on the back. Um, this is what I use most often. Um, I don't find myself needing to split things into 10 squares to the inch typically, um, eight squares to the inch works. I am American and I work in imperial measurements. I do inches and quarter inches and eighth inches. I don't do centimeters. Uh, that's just me. Um, <laughs> again, whatever works for you. Um, but this is a really nice, high quality, uh, good graph paper and can work for your felt tip calligraphy pens also if you know it's a good practice um, you don't have to line the page since it's already got lines um, that. and last 
thing or two things. So graphite paper, um, not carbon paper, because carbon paper can be greasy, um, but graphite paper would be what you'd put behind your graph paper on top of your Bristol, and then you trace over your drawing on your graph paper to transfer it to the Bristol if you don't have a light table or something like that. Um, and then the last helpful thing on the illumination page would be micron pens. Um, I don't use these on the actual scroll. Uh, many people do, and that's okay. Um, but I find that next to a good black gouache line, the micron pen looks gray. And I don't like that, personally. Um, what I use the micron pens for uh, is to trace over my pencil drawing on the graph paper so I can see it better to transfer it then to the Bristol or the Perg or whatever it is I'm using um, for the actual scroll. So they come in different colors, uh, different widths, um, one, three, and five is a good set. Five is pretty wide. I use the, the number three, which is 0.35 millimeter, um, probably most often. Um, but again, they are archival. You can use them on a scroll if you need quick black outlines. I will also use them. So the, the one bit on the actual scroll I do use these for is outlining where my gold is going to go. Um, yeah, another brand, as Lizbeth is pointing out, is the Zig Millennium Inking Pen, um, which is like the Micron Pen, but after using Microns for years, I've noticed they can sometimes smudge when you erase the pencil. The Microns smudge, or the Zig do. Like I say, I don't, I don't use the Micron on the scroll itself, so if it smudges a little when I erase on my graph paper drawing, I really don't care. Um, so, okay, Zig Micron Smudge, the Zig Millennium, is archival and waterproof. Very good. Do you find that they are a good black, or does it tend to gray a little bit, like the Micron? Sweet! Take off every Zig, is that what we do? <sighs> Someone set us up the bomb! Anyway, know your meme. <laughs> and I'm getting a head shake. <laughs> so there's all the helpful things on the illumination side. Uh, helpful for the calligraphy side, uh, more nib sizes, a curl quill and nibs, and more ink colors. Not really anything I can demo there. Um, so we'll move on to the very helpful, which is like your wish list, which is the, the things that, boy, I really would like to have these things. I'm getting... Turn the light on. Oh, turning the alt light on. Excuse it's us. It's gotten dark in here. Oh, it's gotten dark. So we're turning on more lights. There. We can see better now. Hi, everybody. We're back. <laughs> um, so, the very helpful things on our wish list. We have a large triangle, and again, this is my, my uh, one from uh, drafting class, and it's got the, the, the edge to it, so we can use it with uh, ink or paint, and it won't smudge. Um, bigger triangles, bigger lines, easier to use when you have larger scrolls. If you work in miniature, you know, keep your four, two, two to four inch uh, scrolls, you don't need a, quite a big triangle, but most of us don't work that small on a regular basis. Uh, large metal T-square, I showed you that one earlier. A sloped artist table, uh, which is what has been the, the demonstration surface for a while. Uh, this one was 20 bucks, I think, 20, 30, something like that. Um, craft store. It came with a little wooden T-square, so that's neat. What I like about this one is it's multi-height uh, multi adjustable, 
Um, so it can be flat or it can be almost vertical and, and four or five steps in between. Um, Lizabetta got one that is beautiful the other week. I saw it has a drawer on the bottom for all of your most used scribal supplies. Maybe she could share the link to that in the chat. That would be awesome. Um, but the sloped table helps with comfort, really. Um, I find if I'm trying to work on a flat surface for a while, uh, stiff neck, you know, cramping, um, you know, certain things you want to be on a flat surface if you're doing uh, gold leaf, for example, you know, your mini autumn, you want that to, to dry in a nice even uh, layer. You don't want the bottom higher than the top. Um, certain uh, paint, you know, if you're putting down a, a wide background area, if you're on a slope and your paint is too wet, it may run down a bit. So uh, knowing your materials, knowing how you work, uh, will determine your slope. Um, calligraphers, I know Alexander works on, on quite a, a, a steep slope. Um, keeps the ink flowing well. Um, if you're working particularly with a feather quill, which I never have, um, it, it affects how the ink goes onto the page. And I think also, speaking of feather quills, we'll have to go back to a bit because I never talked about cartridge pens. Hmm. Anyway, um, again on the very helpful list, drafting pencil and sharpener. That was the this little blue one with the with the lead that comes in tubes and the and the pencil there. Um, oh, and your drawing that drawing table comes with a wooden. I think they all do would come with a wooden T square because that seems like a good thing to have in combination with with the fancy slope. Um, so yay, that's awesome. So if you don't have a T square and don't have a drawing table, you can get both in one convenient package. Um, so yeah, drafting pencil and sharpener. If you have the space and uh, are very fancy, you can get an actual drafting table, um, which is a slope. And some of them have the, the, the rulers all set up on them. So drafting table, that's, that's on the, the really high wish list there, um, if you've got the room. Uh, exacto knife and blades. Um, super helpful for cutting paper into smaller pieces, you know, along with your metal ruler or metal T-square. Uh, get nice even lines. Um, exacto, I think this is a number five blade. Uh, pretty standard, you know, very sharp. Um, you'll want to you know make sure your blade you swap it out fairly often uh, also comes in handy for fixing mistakes uh, particularly in ink and calligraphy um, you don't really want to use the uh, pointed blade for that because it's possible to gouge the paper uh, but the number 10 blade is like a scalpel blade uh, more curved and that gives you some flexibility on um, it, it makes it harder to, to score and gouge the paper. Um, it's easier to, to gently scrape um, with these and remove what you want to remove and not what you don't. Uh, so X-Acto knife, useful tool. Um, portfolio. There's a couple different uh, portfolio styles. Um, you've got the one that is just good for, you know, transporting things. I made this one out of an old uh, garden center sign uh, that we weren't using. Make sure it's nice and clean. Um, but basically it's just corrugated plastic cut in half, taped together with um, packing tape. Uh, if you want to get real fancy, cover it with fabric. That also helps um, protect the art. Um, what I tend to do, and again on the really helpful list, is uh, tracing paper. 
um, I'll cut a piece of tracing paper and fold it in half and put the scroll inside that for transport. Um, it just helps keep the paint, the gold, things from rubbing on the scroll itself. Um, if you choose to keep physical copies of your artwork, um, as I do, I do a, both a digital scriptoria and a physical one because it's sometimes easier to carry around the physical. Um, this is a black um, Ito, I think. I'll have to I'll have to look up the brand on these, and I'll I'll make sure that's in the the class notes. Um, but again, nice acid-free archival. Uh, they're forty pages a piece, thirty pages a piece, something like that. Uh, double sided. This one's eleven by fourteen. Uh, my first one was 11 by 17, and then I went, oh, I didn't, uh, I'm not doing big scrolls anymore, and then along came Alexander's Laurel Scroll, which is folded in half in here somewhere. Not in half, just a copy. And it's folded there because, guess what, it's bigger than 11 by 14. But anyway, um, <laughs> they come in, uh, it's a whole range of sizes. Um, 11 by 14 or 11 by 17 is a pretty good basic start if you want to keep a physical photocopy record of all of your beautiful artwork. Uh, so that's nice on there. And you can get those again at on Amazon or online, other craft stores, um, all kinds of other things. Uh, the illumination special stuff. Um, the super helpful is a light table. Um, basic, you can make your own out of a light bulb and a Rubbermaid box or a piece of Lexan over a box. Um, you know, something that, that you can put your work on to trace from your graph paper if you so choose to use your graph paper. Um, I've got an LED one and the price on those has come down a lot in the last several years. Um, so you can, my advice on that is at least 11 by 14, um, but kind of get the biggest one you can afford um, because having that space to play with is a really nice thing. Um, you know, you can, you can, well, what's great about a light table is you can tape down, um, different elements you know in the background and then okay I want a tiger here but I also want him over here so rather than drawing the tiger twice on your graph paper necessarily you can make a template or a um, yeah a, a template and just move your artwork and do it that way um, templates are another thing it is not cheating um, they were used in period. Tracing is perfectly period. And Antonio has made a whole bunch of these guys. Rampant Tiger, EK Populous Tiger. They've got rulers on them. He's done ermine spots and escutcheons and all kinds of other things. Um, so we'll, uh, We'll link you up, we'll hook you up with, with these. Um, Max has 3D printed a, an escutcheon template as well, you know, different sizes of shield for that. And uh, we'll, we'll get that information on there as well. But don't be afraid to use templates. Make life easier on yourself. Um, this is supposed to be fun. No stress. Well, the right kind of stress, anyway. Oh, is Kitty wandering around? Yes, Mina. We think Mina's going deaf, so any attempt to get her over here is not going to be successful until she notices things, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> She's 18. She's allowed. Um, so yeah, templates, wonderful things. Um, the last little bit that I have on my list for fun scribal things, and let's see if I can find it. Oh, there it is. Is the ruling pen. 
Katie says, hi. Um, the Tigers, I, I don't know if he's printed any soon, but we'll certainly talk to him. It's Antonio Petrasso. Um, on, on, uh, he's, he's down in New Jersey. Yes, art isn't supposed to be stressful, um, but we'll get, we'll get links. Oh, here comes incoming, incoming kitty cam. Here we are. We're gonna, we're gonna, here. There's Mina. Say hi, Mina. Yeah, she's a happy kitty. Um, but yeah, we'll get, we'll get links. <laughs> We'll get links up there. It's not supposed to be stressful. It's supposed to be art and soothing and happy. And it is totally stressful. Sometimes I, I get it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, back to the art. Something to help make it less stressful. Our lovely little ruling pen. Um, it's adjustable for width. You load it up with paint or ink. And along with your little ruler, you can make nice straight lines if you line it up with the ruler and do it slowly. Um, but really good for finishing the edges of things um, and, and keeping your straight lines straight. Uh, different styles are available. John Neal has some for 50 bucks and some for 20 bucks. And we can, uh, I, I'd recommend the $20 ones. Don't get the $3 ones from Amazon because they do not work. Uh, the tips don't meet and you will have more frustration and more stress. Um, you go ahead and type up your question, Lisbetta, and we'll talk about the one last thing for calligraphy that makes life easier. And this should really be higher on the list, but it's not a, it's not a required thing because you can do the same sort of uh, lining work with, oh, geez, where is it? Hmm. Well, oh, there it is. There we go. You can do the same sort of lining work and calligraphy setup with a ruler and a pencil and a lot of time, or you can save your sanity and use one of these, which is an Ames lettering guide. And here we are with the question. Um, so the Ames lettering guide uh, is, and there's, this is, this is an Ames brand. There's a couple out there on the market that have different brands, uh, or there are different brands, excuse me. They all work the same way. Um, I think they're all set up pretty much the same way. It's a, it's a little funny shape, uh, 68 degree angle, which is, um, I think the angle you use for copper plate, maybe a few Italians, uh, uh, scripts as well. Um, but it's, it's got this, the wheel in the middle, which has several rows of differently spaced holes, uh, markings along the edge and a little line to line them up. And, Basically, uh, you turn the wheel, and as you turn the wheel, the spaces between the dots change when you go to, to use it on the ruler. Um, Alexander did a wonderful video on this, and I will link it uh, in the group or have him link it because he explains it way better than I ever will. Um, I use it to draw lines. Uh, I do test pages and I scribble on it with my nibs, scribble on the test pages with my nibs until I think it looks right and then I just sort of go with it. Uh, there is a way to actually use this and test it and, and, and do it the right way um, and I haven't. <laughs> so, uh, but to get to Lizabetta's question, what's the best way to use an Ames lettering guide so it doesn't move off the ruler? Um, you need a better ruler, I think. So, depending on, you don't, let me see. So this is my corkback ruler. I don't think, it's been a while since I've used this. Um, so I don't think I usually use it with the cork back. 
But that would, yeah, see, that won't work because it's, it's flipping up at the end and then will fall off. So, no on the cork-backed metal ruler. This is where your T-square comes in and your drawing board. As you line your T-square up on the drawing board, um, we'll just use this paper for fun and there's tape, there's tape on the drawing board, so this will be interesting. And this is where, this is not the ideal surface to do this on either, um, because the drawing board is not perfectly flat. This is where your MDF comes in, because it's solid, it's flat, it shouldn't warp as long as it hasn't gotten wet. But, put the ruler down, line your paper up, or put your T-square down, rather. Line the paper up and tape it down so that it's lined up with the ruler, or the T-square, because your T-square is going to slide and keep a consistent uh, straightness with your paper. Um, so the Ames Guide, you'd put it on, and as long as your ruler, your straight edge, is in good contact with your board and good contact with your paper, it shouldn't slide underneath. Um, pressure and angle of use is another thing. Um, so we'll get our pencil out here and we'll just draw some lines. So generally I do this standing actually, but I think the video won't really let me. So we have T-square, we have Ames guide, and it's just at a spacing. And then we just go back and forth, drawing lines. You want a slight downward pressure on your pencil because that keeps it butted up against the uh, T-square and if you have your downward pressure then your pencil is also always landing in the same spot of the hole. Um, this becomes important when you are trying to line up the starting when you when you move the T-square down and have to move and line up your Ames guide again um, to make more lines. So we line that up and again if we were standing, let's see, you might get a shot of my head here. Very exciting. So lining it up so that the pencil line is in the bottom of the hole. Here we go, pressure again on the on the T-square and then continue making lines. So yeah, I think a, I think a heavier weight uh, ruler, you know, something that's a little thicker um, and something that's got a flat edge to it. You don't want you don't want to give the Ames guide the opportunity to slip underneath. Um, so that I think I think you will you will find life gets easier. Um, with with different materials, so, but yeah, I will uh, like I say I'll link to Alexander's excellent how to use this little piece of plastic guide. <laughs> it does come if you buy one. It does come with a little paper guide, but um, I'm an illuminator. Uh, I do calligraphy if coerced, so I use it. Not very often. Um, the other thing you can do with this, and you combine it with your triangle, one of them, sure, we'll use this one. It's really good for diapering um, and, and getting nice even spaces on your backgrounds, say, for the Book of the Hunt with Gaston Phoebus.
Uh, this is one, two. So your triangle, too, might be something. So diapering, Gwen, is just a fancy way of saying filling in the background with a pattern. Um, if you look at uh, the backgrounds behind a lot of illuminated letters, it's like a, a grid or, or a, an array of diamonds, you know, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, and then gold between them sometimes uh, with, with white work. Um, you know, it makes it more interesting than just a solid uh, green or a solid red. Let's read the Ames Lettering Guide instructions. Yep, gone. We don't need them. We'll figure it out on our own. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, no, no children involved, no babies involved. <laughs> so here we are. We've got a nice uh, 45 degree angle triangle here, and we'll use the same. I don't think I've moved it, so we might even get some interesting lines. Uh, so you can use the Ames guide on an angle, like so. And this is so much easier than trying to measure out, um, you know, a, a, an eighth of an inch across the top and the bottom and then match up all of your eighth of an inches and then you find out when you finished your off by one little mark so you don't have diamonds you have you have rhomboids and then you have sadness uh, and stress in art and we don't want stress in art so this helps or it should i hope help reduce the stress so we'll do some of that the the hardest part with this is just making sure nothing moves so you don't want to uh, don't want to clamp everything down within an inch of its life. Ah, wonderful. We'll click on that in a bit. Can I see that if you click on it? Probably not. Maybe. Let's see what happens. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. Our browser doesn't want to do it. <laughs> Maybe. But it will be beautiful. Um, I think it's a click through. Keep clicking. Click. Ah, yes. Hey, brilliant. Love it. Very good. So, Ames Lettering Guide, also useful for illuminators. So we'll add it to both lists. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of where we are as far as tools. Um, we've got a lovely list of books and uh, other sources which we'll put online um, when, I, when I post the class form. Uh, is there anything, I think, I think Lizabetta is the only, uh, and Catherine, um, you two are the more experienced illuminators, I think, out of the people who are watching live tonight, or at least that have spoken up. Um, we may be having some secret observers. Um, is there anything that you use that I didn't mention? Um, anything that you've heard of that uh, you'd like to know about that maybe I have and just didn't put on the list? What, a, what have we got? Any questions? At this point, I think I've gone through all the good toys. Yeah, and Ames eh, kind of demystified. Uh, we, you got the basics anyway. Ah, yes, we didn't even touch on gold leaf tonight. Uh, I, I kind of did that a few weeks ago, but didn't go in too deep. But yes, dedicated brush for gilding size. Um, and gold in general. You know, you don't want to use your flat brush that you use for mixing paint for also brushing on the gold uh, because that would be a disaster. Um, <laughs> pretty sure. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's about all I've got for the evening. Um, hopefully we explored some fun new toys. Oh, Fine Tech Metallics, yes, yes. I've got, uh, so I didn't go into as much detail talking um, 
as I did on uh, the the sheet here. So when we when I get the class notes posted up, there's some there's some notes on that. But yeah, instead of Windsor Newton uh, for your gold, Fine Tech um, has become uh, or Colrico, I think they've been bought. One bought the other. Um, uh, that was that was a a change there. But a lot of Eastern scribes really like the Fine Tech. Oh, right, backing up to um, calligraphy pens again. I got talking about nibs and then completely distracted and didn't say a word about cartridge pens. Um, so if you don't like dip pens because you have to dip them too often, um, cartridge pens... Uh, oh, bye Catherine, thank you for joining us. Hooray! Um, cartridge pens have a cartridge of ink in them that as long as the ink is flowing, you don't have to dip it, you don't have to um, you know, worry about it uh, running out as, as soon. Um, you know, it's consistent. You don't have to worry about blobs quite so much. Uh, so rotring is, is a, a good one. Um, and uh, as is a brand called Manuscript, um, Pilot Parallel pens are also a good one, but generally too wide for SCA scroll use. Uh, John Neal sells one that's been filed down to a one millimeter width um, on that. So cartridge pen, another option for calligraphy. Um, also making your own paint, brilliant. Um, I haven't gotten into that, but I'm glad other people do, and that's wonderful. So yay! Um, Thank you for joining us, Gwyn. It's good to see you. Um, and I think we're about done and other people are running away. So if there aren't any other questions, uh, we'll see folks again, possibly next week. If we can try and get back on the kind of second and fourth Thursday uh, class rotation again. So um, any questions, you know, post, chat, email, it's all good. And uh, thanks for joining me. Have a good night. Yay. I just did your